please welcome Jay Faison. Um, thanks so much for Third Wave for having me. I'm going to break it up a little bit here and walk around, uh, use some slides. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here in front of such an esteemed brood of innovators and risk takers and technical talent. I mean, you are a great, great America's greatest asset, right? This is what built America. These new industries driven by innovators is what built our country, right? Now, I'm just an underpaid nuclear advocate. And, uh, but what I've learned through all of this is that nuclear is really a very complex ecosystem with many different parts. And all of the parts are required. But this ecosystem is in crisis. This ecosystem is in crisis. I think we need to capture that. And in order to fix this crisis, we need innovation, right? But to get the innovation, we need better policy. And we've heard a lot of that. But to get to better policy, I think we need a better story. So while I may lower the average IQ in the room here a bit, I'm going to try a story on you. Uh, I hope you like it. So there are really two types of innovation in America. There's the world that I come from, which is the, really the low end of high tech. Uh, but actually, I'm talking about more real Silicon Valley innovation. Got my clicker. Um, this, is, this is the kind of innovation where America dominates, right? It's creative destruction. It's lots of, uh, it can be built in a garage. You don't need a lot of capital. You can scale quickly. You could have software engineers sitting next to you, and you can have Indian engineers working at night. You can come back the next day. You have code written. You marry that with products. It's, it's super flexible, right? It doesn't require a big, sophisticated supply chain necessarily. Heck, it doesn't even really require any hardware these days. Um, but that's, that's one type. And, and government policy is a nice to have. You need to protect your intellectual property, but, you're, but it's more of a nuisance than anything else. Now, industrial innovation, something that I've started to learn into here, it's entirely different. And I think when most Americans think about industrial innovation, uh, when they think about innovation, they think about Silicon Valley innovation. You think about Uber and Apple and Google. But there's a real misunderstanding about what required to win with big industrial innovation like we do, did in the 50s and 60s. We're not winning that game. You know, China, Korea, Japan was. We are not winning that game today. This is an entirely different game. It requires a lot of capital. It requires a lot of patience. Very long payback periods. It requires a skilled workforce, not necessarily with STEM education, but a lot of advanced welders, advanced technical talent. Um, and you have to have, creative destruction is not a good thing. You don't want one company here today and another company here tomorrow. You need to have consistency. It can take a decade to build a good supply chain, right? And you have to have good government policy. You have to have consistent government policy. And I've been on the Hill a lot, and I think this is, uh, uh, this has kind of been missing in the discussion. So I was at a fundraiser and with a presidential candidate, and he was asked the question, what is your energy policy? And he said, well, right now there's probably a guy in a garage that's coming up with the next greatest thing like we did for fracking. And I'm sitting there going, hold on a second here. Fracking was developed at the Department of Energy. You know, it was a 20-year life cycle. It was hundreds of millions of dollars. What are, you, you know, what are you talking about? Everybody in the room's going, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what we can do. And that's the big gap that we have today, right? This is not a garage, right? <laughs> uh, this is Vogel. And uh, uh, they wouldn't tell me what the train cost, but I think... Somebody slipped and told me I think it was like $100 million to put two reactors in place. for, uh, And then what happens to the train afterwards? I mean, there's no plan on the horizon. I'm not sure what they're going to do with this crane. Uh, it, but it's, it's pretty damn impressive when, when, you, when you see it in action. Uh, 6,000 workers, unbelievable complexity. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we're trying to do all this at the same time. We're really not, we're not building a sustainable supply chain right now. So how, how did we get here? 
I mean, we invented nuclear. We won World War II uh, with nuclear. And then we turned that into what could have been the majority of our energy supply, right? We built it. We studied it. We tested it at national laboratories. We hit the gas. We even got up to building 90 plants at the same time. That's a lot. Right? You can't scale wind and solar anywhere that fast. That's a lot of electricity coming online. But 1979, Three Mile Island, right, followed by the China Syndrome and the environmentalist movement, boy, they were in high gear. And they won. And we stopped. We only finished what was in the pipeline, and we took a 20-year break. Now, imagine you're Vogel. And by the way, I have a ton of respect for Southern Energy. You want to spin back up a new project again okay, with a supply chain that's been dormant for 20 years. That I respect. I mean, crazy. Really, really, really difficult, right? <laughs> Admirable. But that's what we need in this country, right? We need bold moves. If we look forward, what, what do we have to look forward to? We have to look forward to maintenance and upgrades, right? If I'm a supplier, am I really going to invest in my business when that's what I'm looking at? I, I met a, a nuclear engineer in Charlotte who was one of the best and the brightest, a really smart kid. Went to work, second week on the job, CEO comes in, we got a great opportunity. It's around decommissioning power plants. He's like, okay, all right. Went back, sharpened up his resume, left the industry. I mean, honestly, that's kind of where we are, right? I think we need to call a spade a spade. We're in a crisis situation. We are losing to Russia and China. They have the foot on the gas, the car is well ahead of us on the highway, right? And uh, if you look at Wen Xiaobo, what he, the, the former premier said, and this is so Chinese, right? We're going to advance in an orderly and steady manner. And when you're talking about building a big industry, that's the way you got to do it, right? Stagger your plants. Engineers work on one plant, learn, move up the ranks, manage the next part of the supply chain at the next plant. That's what's required. And we are not doing that. The Russians are doing it. The Chinese are doing it. The Koreans are doing it. We're not doing it. So if we're in Saudi Arabia trying to sell U.S. technology against those folks, and we go, well, we didn't really do it that well in our country, but we're going to do it really well for your country. And they go, well, you know, we don't have all these engineers and stuff. What can you do for, can you bring the whole, we can't bring the whole supply chain. China can literally bring the whole supply chain, and they are, and they'll build it all. But we won't have any say in, uh, in any nuclear control, any proliferation control, and I'll get to that. So... We're, we're on the international marketplace, if you look at the percentage of projects that are being managed or built out there, uh, we're really not a player. So what? So what's the big deal? I mean, if you're pitching me and I'm in Congress and I got 100 things on my desk, what's the big deal? So I mean, in shipbuilding, we went from first to irrelevant. So what if we do the same thing? Is that a big deal? Well, I think it is, right? And it's, it, it's an economic story. It's a national security story. Right? We, we built this industry, and when we did, we were pretty responsible with it. We set up South Korea. We set up a lot of hooks in those supply chain agreements, right? One, two, three agreements from the State Department, you know, proliferation controls, those kind of things. Well, you know, China might not have the same standards we do. And if you look at Iran, I'd probably argue that maybe they don't have the same standards. And by the way, as you all know, and by the way, during this talk, I don't think you're going to learn any facts. I realized that after talking to you at coffee, but maybe the story is beneficial. All these countries are coming online. We have no say in who gets it and how they use it. That's in the, it's really in China and Russia's hands. That's not good. The nuclear navy, I mean, nuclear really drives our most important navy assets, carriers and subs. Like if this industry starts doing what it continues to do what it's doing, which is collapse in on itself, you don't have a career path for navy nukes, and there's stress in the supply chain because obviously there's overlaps between the domestic energy and the navy nuclear uh, supply chain. It's a huge industry. Related jobs, 475,000 jobs. And this isn't, you know, you got your shovel in the ground one day and then you're worried about the next job, the, ne the, the next one, the next. If you have a sustainable nuclear industry, you have high paying, skilled labor jobs, and that's really what we're missing today in this country, right? Instead of putting a band aid on, why don't we go to the root of the problem and fix that? Let's fix this. Internationally, we don't know how big the energy market's going to be. Right? I mean, we don't know how many air conditions the Indians are going to buy. The, fi the, the Chinese bought 50 million air conditioners last year. So it's a huge market. Who's going who's to win this market? Not us the way it's going today, right? So 
enough doom and gloom. Let's talk about a solution. Like, let's, let's pivot here a little bit. What do we do about it? Well, we have technologists that have better technology, which, which makes sense since we created all this here in the first place, right? I mean, we just let it go. But we, we have these designs, right? We have more creative, we have more creativity in this room in nuclear than a lot of country, than countries could ever hope for, a lot of countries could ever hope for. And the great thing about smaller reactors and advanced reactors is they play to our strengths. I mean, if you think about a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, you should play to your strengths, right? You should mitigate your weaknesses. You should leverage your opportunities and eliminate your threats. What are our strengths? Design, advanced engineering, advanced manufacturing, right? Small and medium-sized reactors play exactly into that space. By doing that, we would actually allow ourselves to export. We don't have to ship 6,000 people to a job site in Saudi Arabia, right? I mean, if these are walk-away safe with a lower safety envelope and a third of the steel, structural steel rebar and cement, right? Perhaps we can compete. Or we could allow the Russians and Chinese to come here in our country and sell to us. That actually could happen one day, right? I mean, that's kind of a strange thought. If you think about weaknesses, we're just not going to out-cement the Chinese. That's not going to happen, right? This mitigates that weaknesses. Uh, opportunity, I think I just spoke to. And the threat, if we stay in the international supply chain, then we have a say in nuclear proliferation, right? When Egypt comes online, we're there at the table. If they want our technology, there's a role for us to play. Like, I, how many people are fr from the Hill here? Anybody? OK, Does that, would, that, would that argument play? I mean, I hope so, right? Because that's what we're looking for, right? Because we've got to have better policy. But the, here come the Chinese again, right? They're actually doing this. High temperature gas cooled reactor, they say it's going to be finished this year. I've spent a lot of time in China. They actually finished. And I know nuclear might be an exception. But generally, give them enough time, they're going to finish when they say they're going to finish, right? They are unbelievably efficient. I've seen it with my own eyes over a lot of years. I'll bet this thing gets done. Two more in the pipeline, and Saudi Arabia's already hired an MOU for the same type of reactor in their country. So this is a little bit of a, a little bit of embarrassment here, right? And this is the, these are the kind of stories I hope that resonate, because we built the technology, we have the designs, China has effectively just taken those designs and started to commercialize them. And what are we doing? We are hamstringing our entrepreneurs with crazy regulations so that we can't take the ideas that we invented here and commercialize those ideas. Right? That should make us a little ashamed of ourselves, I think, as a country. So why? Why, with all these opportunities and risks, are we such a low priority? Well, when I got to D.C., and I spent a lot of time sort of advocating, let's call it that. And uh, so I asked somebody, why, why would I, what I think are priorities, you don't, and vice versa. Why are the big things not necessarily the first things? And they said, well, Jay, you have to understand, there's two forms of time in DC. There's now, and there's not now, right? And it made a lot of sense, right? We're in a 24-hour news cycle. There's a lot of folks coming at the, I mean, the you know, the amount of mail that comes in the offices and all these things is very distracting. We live in an AD, ADD world, not just in Washington, D.C. So we have to rise above the noise, right? Now, somebody told me that this movie was about energy lobbyists. Does that, could this look familiar? Could you see somebody about to lose their plan in, in the stairway with a, uh, a staffer? Uh, I could see that as a staffer there. Unfortunately, the nuclear industry, I think nobody in this room had a part in this movie. Right? At least from my experience uh, on the Hill and around town, we don't, we're not delivering the same level of impact and the same level of urgency around these issues. And frankly, the squeakiest wheel gets the most grease. Right? I think we need to squeak a lot more. But I also think we need a story. Right? What pulls people? There's two ways to share information. We can push it or we can pull people into a story. Right? Good stories are good marketing, and that sells. And we have a great story. Right? We invented this here in this country. This is one of, was one of our most successful industries, employed the most people, supplied affordable and clean power 
could have been a majority of our power supply. We had a problem. <laughs> you know, we had, a, we had an incident at the end of the 70s that, that basically turned public opinion against us, and we've been struggling ever since. We then try to amp back up again. We try four or five plants at the same time. We don't get those sort of sequential learnings. We're now over, over budget and over time. People think we're too expensive. And, he, and, and wake up one morning, today, we are in a crisis. Now, if we want to participate in the now and the not now continuum, let's just call it a crisis, right? The good news is, it is a crisis, right? We cannot afford to just let this industry go away. Now, but what's the significance? We say we have a crisis, but what's the significance? We have to explain that. And it has to be more that everybody's got a job story. We need to tell the job story, but we need to do more. We need to put this into a tight story. A lot of other lobbyists, a lot of other industries, a lot of other advocates have a lot of consistency in the way they tell this. So that the people, the lawmakers, the policymakers are hearing a consistent message and story that raises the importance of the issue. I think this is critical. We're all working on ideas. We've heard a lot of them today. We're all working on policy. But to what end? How do these policies that are sporadic, I think we can all agree on that today, lead to the things that will allow us to compete with the Chinese and the Russians and keep our country safe? I think we need goals. I think our policies, or call them tactics, need to align to bigger goals. One idea we have is four advanced reactors on a cost share or a government-owned site by 2026 at a competitive price. It's, a, it's an idea, right? It's one goal. But love to have some more ideas. Now, if we have that, if we have a clear and compelling story, we acknowledge that we're in a crisis, we've built the significance, and we've got a package of policy that makes sense, as a tight solution, I, don't, I still don't think we're there. I think we need one more thing. I think we need a national priority statement, right? We had one. Uh, we had one. I'll go to that. Here's an, here's an idea. This is just one idea. The U.S. nuclear industry is a priority for our national security, economy, and diverse energy systems. You know, that's not, that's not anything. Uh, I'm not going to win a creative award for that. But if we could tell the story and get the White House on board with that, that gives us pressure. That gives us something in the system that pushes these things through, right? Because right now we're stuck. Congress, this story is virtually unknown in the halls of power in the government. Would you guys agree with that? Some, there's, okay, we're doing better than I thought. I, I, would, I, would, I, I think we need to do a bit better. And, but we've done it before. This is not such a crazy idea. We had Dwight D. Eisenhower that basically prioritized taking our industrial weapons, our nuclear weapons capabilities, and turning that into domestic energy. And it worked, right? But it was a national priority. People knew that. And I think that's what's required. So anyway, look, I, I actually did this speech for a couple reasons. One, I'm honored to be here, and I'm a big, I, I like what Third Way is doing. But I also wanted to force myself into trying to craft a story on something that's very, very complex. So this was, this was my rough draft. This was my attempt. I'm, I'm, I think the next shot at this is to get to a card, not a stack of papers. One card we can all pull out of our pocket and go, this is why we need to prioritize nuclear policy today. It's a, it, is a, it, it has to be a national priority. So I'll leave you with this. Um, I don't know how many people have been to Israel, but I'm always, I'm always impressed when I see youngsters at cafes with, back then it was M16 strapped to the backs. And I thought to myself, in this fight, we need to think like the Israeli army. Everybody at the age of 19, Boys have to serve two, three years. Women serve two years. You have, to, you have to serve. And when you serve, you always carry your weapon, whether you're on duty or off duty. And I think that's a good analogy for today. We all need to be in the Army, and we all need to have a weapon, and that weapon is our story.
Thank you.